Good morning, everyone. And once again, I'd like to welcome you all and appreciate you accepting our invite to join the webinar. Of course, standard rules of being of having online discussions apply. So we request that you all be on mute unless you ask to speak and kindly turn off your cameras unless if you are a panelist or if you've been asked to turn it on. At this point uh, in time, I'd like to welcome Emal Shah to give the opening remarks on behalf of Grant Thornton. You got, of Grant Thornton. Emal Shah is uh, the manager of the IT of, of Hemalcha is a manager in the Grand Thornton Advisory East Africa Limited and she's been with us for quite some time. She has a lot of experience and on behalf of management she's here to welcome all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Elisan. And um, a very good morning to all of you. Um, on behalf of Grant Thornton, I welcome you all to this webinar and thank you for being with us here today. Um, before a couple of years, the words um, data protection and data privacy were just jargons for many of us. For general population, we only became aware of the importance of the data and seriousness of its breach when probably Facebook had to pay USD 4.9 billion to Federal State Commission for leakage of personally identifiable data of about 87 million of its users. Until then, most of us would really not bother to sign into a free Wi-Fi or accept applications to collect whatever information they would wish to. Throughout 2021, um, issues such as sophisticated cyber attacks and evolving state of data privacy laws dominated the headlines. Um, the past year also showcased uh, the ongoing cyber risks of remote and hybrid work environments and the rise of ransomware attacks. To minimize exposure, um, organizations and their councils must keep up with the dynamic and increasing legal obligations that govern data privacy and security, understand how they apply and manage the compliances. We at Grant Thornton um, hence believe that it is critical and our moral responsibility to share the knowledge on Data Protection Act and related regulations and support dynamic clients and organizations like all of you through challenging legal obligations in relation to the fast changing privacy and data security risks. On this webinar, we are highly privileged to have attendance and representation from the Data Protection Office of Uganda, the Pivotal Authority. Thank you so much for being here with us on the subject and um, learned lawyer Mr. Amit Gardia. Um, a team of legal experts will enlighten us on the subject in a very simple and lucid fashion. I'm therefore very certain that you will have this, uh, you, you'll, you'll leave this webinar with a lot of key takeaways and insights. I do not want to take too much of your time as I need to leave enough time for the panelists to take us through. So very warm welcome once again and thank you all for attending this webinar. Thank you very much, Hemal Shah. I would, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you our panelists. Uh, maybe just to give you a brief on how the session is going to be. Uh, we are, it's going to basically be a Q&A session wherein we ask uh, our panelists a couple of questions so that they can shed more light on the act, because I know uh, it's been in effect since 2019 and so, a lot of information has been going around, but we, when we did a survey with our clients, we found that many of them didn't know a lot about it, and some of them requested that we shed more light. Hence, inviting the people that we have to come and help shed more light. So the first panelist I'm going to introduce is Miss Stella Aliwatese, who is the national date. 
National Personal Data Protection Director in Uganda with the Personal Data Protection Office. The Personal Data Protection Office is an independent office set up under the National Information Technology Authority, Uganda, to be responsible for personal data protection in Uganda. She is responsible for the management and operationalization of the Personal Data Protection Office and is the national focal point for monitoring and assurance of matters related to the implementation of the Data Protection and Privacy Act 2019. She's a practicing advocate with 25 years of experience, with a bulk of it being on policy and regulatory matters in the private sector. 10 years of this experience has been in the ICT sector where she has made tremendous contribution to regulations in the ICT sector. Prior to this appointment, she worked as the Director of Regulation and Legal Services at the National Information Technology Authority, NITAU, where she led teams in the development of laws, including the current Data Protection and Privacy Act of Uganda and legal instruments for regulating of the regulation of the ICT sector with a focus on the development of electronic government in Uganda. She has also over the years provided excellent in-house legal counsel services with a proactive approach. Stella also worked with the National Social Security Fund, NSSF, for 10 years, where she rose to the position of Deputy Corporation Secretary, Stroke Acting Co Corporation Secretary, uh, with Maze Hunter and Greg Advocate and Tropical Bank Limited. She holds a Master's of Laws from the University of London, UK, Postgraduate Diploma in Project Planning and Management from UMI, Postgraduate Diploma in Legal Practice from LDC Kampala, and a Bachelor's of Law from Makere University. She is a GISC Certified Professional, Law of Data Security and Investigations, and an I. APP Certified Information Privacy Manager. She is an advocate and commissioner of oaths and a member of various professional associations. Stella is passionate about issues affecting youth and women and believes that through ICT, they can be empowered to develop and harness their talents to overcome the various challenges they face. She's a mentor with the Girls of Girls Program in Uganda and a Rotarian. So welcome, Stella. Kindly give us your opening remarks. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank uh, Ellison for that uh, uh, beautiful introduction. I am very grateful to Grant Thornton for this uh, webinar. Uh, indeed, as uh, indicated by Misha, uh, following the passing of this law in 2019, we were only able to uh, develop the regulations in 2021. So indeed, the need to create awareness is, is very big. And we appreciate um, efforts like those uh, by Grant Thornton to introduce this law to our citizens, our residents, to organizations that operate in Uganda, so that we create that much needed awareness, not only for the organizations, but for the uh, data subjects whose uh, data uh, is collected. I'm looking forward to the discussion that we'll have uh, through this webinar, and I hope that we'll have many, many more so that we improve uh, the level of awareness about these laws. Uh, data protection matters do not only affect organizations, but they mainly affect us as individuals. So it's important for us that when we create this awareness, when we learn something, we share it with our um, either our teams or those people that are around us. Uh, thank you very much, Grant Thornton, for this uh, opportunity, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella, for those words. Now, our next panelist is going to be Mr. Amit Gadia. Mr. Amit uh, has been in the legal practice for over 24 years with intervals. He 
had relocated to the United Kingdom before returning to Kenya a few years back uh, to commence his legal practice as a sole practitioner. He's a founder of two successful law firms and has considerable experience establishing and successfully running businesses, startups, and education consultancy operating internationally. He is he has uh, an LLB honors degree from Cardiff University, Wales, UK. He's an advocate of the High Court in Kenya, solicitor of England and Wales. He's a certified international privacy professional, a One Trust Fellow in Privacy Technology. He's a certified public secretary for ICS Kenya. He's an associate of the Chartered Governance Institute in the UK. He has a diploma in law and qualified lawyers transfer Kim solicitor with the regulation authority. He's a commissioner of, a, of oath and a notary public. Uh, Mr. Amit, kindly give us your opening remarks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Alison, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be among this uh, uh, and a privilege to be among the panelists today. Um, I am very passionate about data protection. I've been practicing it for just a uh, uh, well, number of years now. Uh, needless to state, as Hamal said earlier, and uh, as Madam, uh, the National Personal Data Protection Director, uh, Madam Stella said earlier, data protection is a lot about human rights. Uh, data protection is not just about organizational uh, compliance, but is about human rights stemming all the way from World War II. Uh, data protection has become very, very important, especially in today's age when we are seeing conflicts around the world. So what I will uh, attempt to bring today is an international perspective, especially being a practitioner in, um, in the UK as well as in, in, in Nairobi. Uh, I will try and see make comparisons as to how data protection is more or less uh, globally applicable and the principles of data protection, the, the rights of individuals are very similar across the board, whether it's Kenya, Uganda, or the United Kingdom or Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Amit. Our next panelist is Mr. Satyajit Turumela. Satyajit uh, is, a, is a professional in the IT sector with over 20 years of experience in IT. He's a certified data privacy solutions engineer with ISACA, a skilled IT professional uh, in IT systems audits, including cloud architecture audits, blockchain audits, container audits, IT audit standards and guidelines, IT field concept practices, procedures, ability to design and execute diverse audits with an IT intensive environment. He has experience in application controls reviews and cyber security reviews, providing cost effective information systems implementation solutions, information system service management. He has applied his experience in information system strategy, data privacy and protection compliance reviews, development, implementation, audit and cybersecurity to provide quality value added services to clients and helps to achieve business growth and risk management and compliance. And he's also the director of Grant Thornton Advisory, East Africa, uh, Grant Thornton East Africa Advisory Limited. Uh, and he happens to be my boss. So Mr. Santiajit, kindly please give your opening remarks. Thank you, Alison, uh, for that um, opening remarks. Um, glad to share the stage with uh, Madame Stella and Mr. Gadia on this professional forum. Um, as both uh, Madam Stella and uh, Mr. Gadia have made reference to how this is a human rights event, uh, in the recent events we have seen that COVID-19 has become uh, a, a very uh, big game changer when we're looking at the new normal. So technology as an enabler of services has now taken over almost everyone's lives and now with the new normal, more people are reliant on technology, which means that there is that element of 
um, privacy that is now key when we're doing business, when we're doing uh, work as usual on a daily basis, even when you're just commuting. So um, my key um, area that I will be dealing with is how you can safeguard yourself and how you can probably understand how to safeguard the risks that your businesses are facing when looking at technology as an enabler of services and when you're looking at privacy of data subjects, which include both your internal stakeholders and your external stakeholders. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand um, the stage back to Alison. Alison, over to you. Thank you, sir. Now, our last but not least panelist is Ghazali Mohammed, who is an assistant manager in Grand Thornton East Africa Advisory Limited. Ghazali has over 15 years of experience in IT and specializes in requirements, gathering and analysis, application systems design, networking, administration, IT support, and has been with Grand Thornton for over eight years. He brings on board a wealth of knowledge in cybersecurity, network management, server optimization and security using CATs like caseware, firewall, uh, like caseware, firewall and antivirus configuration. He has a breadth of knowledge and experience in IT general and automated control reviews and data protection impact assessment reviews in industries like manufacturing, banking, insurance, among others, and also happens to be the data protection officer for all the Grand Thornton Uganda entities. Ghazali, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Edison, thank you for that introduction. I unfortunately don't have the distinguished credentials like uh, my fellow panelists. Mine is a very small role here. I will uh, try and give as much of the little uh, knowledge that I've learned regarding data protection, more from the perspective of a data protection officer, which is basically what I am at uh, Grand Thought in Uganda. Um, I honestly don't see that anything that I need to add because I know for a fact there's a lot we're going to discuss in in this uh, session. So I think I would like to hand it back to you and we can proceed from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ghazali. So that's the Maybe just to brief everyone on what the session is going to be like, I have a couple of questions that we've gotten from uh, from the surveys that we carried out with our clients, uh, the things that they felt they needed they needed more information on, and those I'll be addressing to the panel. Because this is an informatory session, we expect that if anyone from the audience has any question, please jot them down in the chat because this session is basically for all of you. Kindly write down the questions in the chat box such so, so that after we can ask the panelists to help elucidate and share more light on, on them. So just to quickly dive in, uh, for us to get a brief understanding, I'd like Mr. Amit Gadia to just help and highlight on uh, the, the rights of the data subjects because we found out that most data subjects are unaware of their rights and are taken advantage of for example you find that with many organizations many buildings that we go to there's a book that we sign in where they request for our, our full names they request for our phone numbers our address which is all termed as personal information in the act so mr admit can you kindly help highlight for us what the rights of the data subjects are and what they should be knowing about. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Um, basically, uh, what what Alison stated is a practice which is rife across not only in uh, Kampala, uh, well, Uganda, but across even in Nairobi and across Kenya. Um, what you will find is that the organizations are doing it not because that they wish to breach data protection regulations, but I think they are not aware as to that that practice is not correct. So essentially, when people they, they collect their uh, the, the, the ID numbers, the phone numbers, uh, whatever the, the, the vehicles and registration numbers, those practices, generally speaking, uh, can could be termed as disproportionate. 
um, of, of collection of personal data because they lack the lawful basis for purposes of collecting that personal data. So essentially, when we talk about the rights, uh, first of all, whenever any personal data is being collected or processed, uh, whether as a data controller or as a data processor, um, you, any organization needs to assess and ascertain that you have a lawful basis for processing that personal data. Now, except for a few variations uh, under the GDPR, uh, the Kenya Data Protection Act, and I believe the Uganda Data Protection Act, the lawful basis for processing the personal data are very similar across the board. So essentially, it's either you have uh, the consent uh, of the data subject, legitimate interest, uh, or public interest or public authority. So there are various uh, lawful basis for processing. And should an organization not have the lawful basis for processing their personal data, then you cannot simply uh, process. It's as simple as that. So that should be the first question you must answer in the, in, in, in the positive. Do you have the right to process their personal data? The, in terms of the rights, the rights across the board uh, under the GDPR, the UK GDPR, the Kenya Data Protection Act, and also the, the, the Uganda Data Protection Act can be categorized broadly into four basic broad categories. So the first right is for every organization to be, in, well, every data subject or individual to be informed. So the right to be informed, the information notices. What does that mean? So essentially, at the point of collection, all organizations must inform the data they're collecting, whether that is for their customers, their employees, the whoever individual is interacting with that organization, what, are, what data is being collected, how is it being collected, who is it being uh, shared with, how long is it going to be kept for and how long are you going to be, uh, how long is it, uh, uh, is it going to be retained and whether there is a sharing of the data with any third party, right? Um, normally when you, when, you, when you sign up, say for example, on a website or an app, you will normally see at least two to three checkboxes, uh, which is very common. Uh, and hopefully that will also be very common across Kenya and Uganda. Um, so one, the first box you'll find is the terms and conditions. Uh, that will be the contractual obligations for both parties. The second box you will see is the privacy notice or the privacy policy. The, so that is essentially what is a right to be informed. So you are informing the point of collection, the data subject or the individual whose data has been collected, that they are, um, uh, how they are, the data is going to be processed. So that is the first broad category, the right to be informed. The second category can, is, is, a, is a right to access. So essentially a subject access, so acts right to access your data, right to rectification and right to portability. So the subjects, so any individual uh, whose data you collect and if it is um, if, if, if should they uh, uh, complete their forms and then they ask for access to their data, then any organization has to be within prescribed time limits, uh, reply to the data subject um, that what data the organization holds on them. Of course, there are certain exceptions, um, but uh, generally speaking, they have the right to access their data, right? And under the right to access, there's also, also the right to rectification. So what that means is, for example, my name is Amit Gadia, but that's not my full name. So for example, if I have my data with Grant Thornton and I can go come to Grant Thornton even after a number of months or years, and I say to Grant Thornton, I have now changed my name. My name is Amit so-and-so. So now could you kindly change my name? So the Grant Thornton has to, within the prescribed time limits, whether it's on the GDPR, the Care Data Protection Act or the Uganda Data Protection Regulations, um, they have to rectify, and that's my right. You cannot ignore that. Um, and then there is a right to portability. The right to portability is very, very narrow. Uh, currently also under the GDPR or under the Data Protection uh, Regulation uh, Acts in, in Kenya, 
it's not very uh, clear as to how it is being uh, enforced or practiced, but then generally speaking is a right to port your data from one uh, usable format to another. So this would specifically be applicable to say telecommunication, uh, telecommunication organizations uh, where you can transfer your data from one uh, telecommunication company to another, right? Um, the next two are the right to object. So the right to object is, 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 is uh, uh, say for example, an employee or a customer can come to you and say, look, I am going to object you to processing my personal data. Um, the, 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 the example which was given at the beginning, for example, uh, um, uh, that you know, if you go to shopping malls, you have your ID cards captured or your ID numbers captured, or you have your phone numbers captured, you can object to that. Because if, 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 if they say that, look, we do not have lawful basis, how do you capture uh, their data? So they're right to object. However, again, as I said earlier, there are certain exceptions. Uh, what that means is you, for example, it would be an employee cannot come to you and say, look, I'm objecting you to sending my data to the, say, Uganda uh, Revenue Authority, the Kenya Revenue Authority. I mean, yeah, it would, it would be very nice if we did not have to pay taxes. Uh, but but um, you cannot uh, object because that is a legal obligation, right? So there are certain exceptions to that. And then there is a right to, uh, as they call it under the GDPR, the right to erasure, the right to deletion. Um, and then the right to erasure mainly arises is if there is no lawful basis for processing the personal data or if, for example, the retention period for the personal data has lapsed and the right to restriction of processing. So the right to restriction is very closely knit to the right to object. So for example, uh, if, if, if there is an, uh, uh, the, an individual can come back to you and say, look, uh, can you restrict? I do not wish you to process my personal data. Uh, so essentially they are restricting, but then the rest of the, 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 you have to verify with that individual or data subject. Why are, you, are they asking you to restrict? What are their reasons? Do they have credible reasons, right? They cannot just exercise uh, the right to restrict uh, as and when they deem fit, but there are certain exceptions and they have to, the, 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 and there has to be proper grounds for doing that, right? Um, and generally speaking, uh, some of these rights are absolute. So, for example, the right uh, to you know, for, for direct marketing, generally speaking, across the three, uh, you know, I think globally, um, uh, because global, you know, the, 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 when, when it comes to direct marketing, he, the, the one of the main, well, the only lawful basis for processing personal data is consent. And um, Consent, uh, a lot of the times, can be misconceived uh, and misconstrued in the sense that organizations sometimes feel that why don't we just you know, say, for example, the consent of uh, individual, we just get it signed and then we can do whatever we want with their personal data. Now, that is highly misconceived and incorrect. Um, as you will find as you go along and our data protection, uh, the compliance and our journeys in data protection uh, matures. Uh, I believe most organizations in Kenya, Uganda, and even, even in, in, in Europe and UK uh, are still at very, very initial stages of the maturity of their data protection programs. Uh, you will find that as, as they mature, you find that uh, you need the compliance is required much more and consent as a lawful basis for processing needs to be thought over very carefully because under all of those uh, data protection regulations, you need to consent can be given. It has to be voluntarily, freely, but then it can also be withdrawn uh, at, 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 at the discretion of the individual and, and you cannot question the individual when they withdraw the, the, the consent, right? So, um, yeah, that is a brief snapshot about uh, the data subject rights. And uh, uh, and I will hand over to the 
uh, presenter. Alison, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amit. Now to the panelists, if any of you have anything to add, just feel free to do so at, at uh, when the question has been addressed. If you have anything to add to that, just feel free to do so at any point in time. So uh, in regards to what Mr. Amit has highlighted, especially when it comes to the right to object. So this is for you, Madam Stella. What uh, if, if at all an organization or data collector or processor fails to prove to me when I ask uh, if they fail to prove to me as a data subject that they have legal precedence or they have the legal right to collect the personal data that it is that they're requesting for, can they deny me, are they allowed to, to deny me access to the service, whatever it is that I'd gone for, or not? And if so, then how do I address that as a data subject? Okay, thank you for that question. In a way, um, Amit uh, touched on the issues that I was going to talk about uh, because the, the law gives you certain rights and um, uh, it also provides for certain measures that must be taken by organizations that collect personal, uh, personal data. One of that of those requirements is that they must give you information so that you're able to make an informed decision on whether you want to, to give them the consent or not. And that was touched on by Amit. But um, under the Ugandan law specifically, some of the information that a uh, data controller is supposed to provide includes um, uh, information to the data subject on whether the collection of that data is mandatory or discretionary. The other requirement is that the data controller must provide or give information on the consequences for, for refusal uh, to provide that information. Uh, rightly so, Amit did state that yes, you can object to the collection of your data, that is a right under the law, but there are still certain exceptions. And uh, for the Ugandan law, these exceptions include uh, where an organization has a legitimate interest uh, to collect uh, this information. And a legitimate interest means that even you as a data subject, you would reasonably expect that this information is required for them to be able uh, to, um, uh, to carry out their, uh, their mandate or to implement whatever they need uh, to implement. The other exceptions are that if it is a requirement of the law, then you're required uh, to provide that information. The example I can give is that um, if you're accessing a government service, or let's say you're accessing a, a telecom service, under our laws here in Uganda, you're required to register your SIM card. For you to register your SIM card, they will need information on your national ID. So you can't go to a telecom company and you say, um, I'm not consenting, I, I will not uh, uh, give you this information because they are mandated by the law to collect uh, this information. Or they may be mandated by a contract that you've entered into with them to collect this information or they need this information for as, a, as part of the process for you to enter a, a contract with them. So the data subject has to take all those issues into uh, consideration. Obviously, if you go to a data subject and you find, to a data controller, and you find, for instance, they are asking for excess information, or you feel uh, the it's difficult to object to a purpose because the purpose is really determined by, uh, by the data controller. But it's up to you to uh, evaluate based on the information that has been given to you, whether you're comfortable sharing your personal information with this uh, organization. However, when you object, the, the, the options you may have 
yes, the company or the organization may deny your service. Uh, first of all, it may be that they are not able to offer you that service within the law without that information or within their own um, uh, policies and procedures, they are still not able to provide you that service. What you need to do is to make a complaint. The law gives you that right. If you feel that someone is infringing on your rights, that they are collecting unnecessary information, that uh, they've not complied with the requirements of the law, for instance, in terms of giving you uh, enough information, uh, having a complaint mechanism in place, then uh, you have a right to complain to the office. And our portal has um, guidelines on how you can do that. And we've also automated that process for complaints handling. So my answer is that it depends on the circumstances. Um, yes, the organization can refuse to give you a service if you, if you refuse to give them that information but they should explain to you why. If you feel that their explanation is not valid, then you have a right to complain to the office. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Stella. Now, in, in addition to that, um, this one Ghazali can take on, uh, Mr. Ghazali can take on, and maybe Stella can add more if, if any. Uh, when we when we're looking at the landscape, when we're advising many of our clients, we tell them that they need to be compliant with the law and they all need to register. But many, the question that we get a lot from many of them is, one, which companies, which type of organizations are supposed to register with the Data Protection Office? Uh, is it restrictive to the size of the organization or, or a business or not? So basically, we want some, some bit of clarity. We'd like to get some bit of clarity on what type of organizations need to register with the Data Protection Office and why should should they? If, let's say I have a very small business. I only have, let's say, five employees. Why should I also register with the Data Protection Office? So, Ghazali, over to you. Thank you, Edison. Um, allow me to to be uh, to speak like this as I'm not sure about the Internet speeds. Um, so. Now, coming to the question, the uh, the organizations. Um, so I'll just maybe I'll have to talk about the the act itself uh, to kind of give us a bit of context. And uh, it states that uh, the, the Data Protection Privacy Act of 2019 applies to any person, institution or public body collecting, processing, holding or using personal data within Uganda and outside Uganda for those who collect, process, hold or use personal data relating to Ugandan citizens. So if I may just uh, give you uh, my own experience previously, uh, before I started reading the documentation, I thought that this applies mainly to big companies, those who handle large data like the telecom companies, MTNs and the et cetera, et cetera. But as you can see from the act itself, it outlines that as long as you hold any personally identifiable information, however small you are, uh, you may be two employees or five or ten. The fact is, as long as you have in your possession personally identifiable data of a Ugandan citizen, then you need to register with the PDPO. So um, it applies basically to any and every organization and more especially as long as you have an HR department, then you most certainly have to uh, register with the with the Personal Data Protection Office. Um, uh, as uh, Alison had mentioned, Stel Madam Stella, you're free to uh, supplement if there are any things I may have left out. Uh, perhaps if I may move to the second part of the question, which is why is this required? So if we have agreed that it's every organization within uh, that is that holds uh, personal identifiable data, then what is the reason? So the reason for this is, in, is to ensure that the person, institution or public body is regulating the collection and processing of personal data, uh, among other things, providing rights for the data subjects and obligations of the data collectors, controllers, processors, as well as regulate the use or disclosure of personal information and related matters. 
So, so uh, in, a, in summary, it is mainly to ensure that the reason for registration is to ensure that the data is has uh, appropriate controls and safety uh, measures to ensure that there is no leakage of data or the proper procedures are being followed. Uh, Madam Stella, you're free to add any uh, uh, any uh, more information, but th that's basically what uh, it is from my end. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ghazali, for, for that uh, response. I believe you are, are spot on because indeed the law provides that every organization that collects, processes uh, personal data is required uh, to register. There's a question that I saw on the forum, so I'll take this opportunity to answer it um, from Ms. Jasmine Shah. Uh, why is it mandatory for each and every business, irrespective of the size, to register with the office? Uh, I believe Ghazali has answered um, part of that. Uh, we believe that any organization that is collecting, regardless of the um, uh, regardless of the size, should register because even if it is five individuals, we need to ensure that uh, we know where this organization is. Uh, registration helps us um, in many ways. The first one is for us to identify who is collecting and processing personal data in the country. The second one is that as part of that registration process, it helps organizations start that process of, um, uh, of compliance. Because when you fill in that form, it will help you to uh, even think about how much data do I collect? Uh, which data do I collect? Uh, how long will I retain this data? And things like that. As you go through that, uh, that, filling that form, it also helps you to bring to the fore some of these issues that you should be discussing uh, in the organization. Um, we also use that form to be able to collect information on the designated data protection officers. And we use these data protection officers to provide uh, training, um, uh, to give them uh, tools and things like that to enable them um, improve compliance within, um, within their organizations. So for us, registration is very, uh, is very critical. We've made it very easy for organizations to register. Uh, the registration process is fully automated. So you can start that process wherever you are, and it's very seamless. Uh, we've made the, we've broken down the forms. We've provided guidance notes. Even within uh, the the forms itself, within the system, there are so many guidance notes that you have. So we've made that process uh, very very easy. Lastly, the in terms of even the cost of registration, we uh, the law provides for a blanket. Uh, charge of a hundred thousand, which is uh, maybe about twenty-five dollars, which we believe is also affordable, um, and that helps us with running uh, the system and things like that. So um, we encourage all organizations uh, to register as long as you collect or process personal data, regardless of uh, of the size of the organization. However, we know that in some cases that processing may not be uh, for a long period. Um, if you're processing for, uh, for, personal, uh, for personal, maybe for family reasons, uh, the law gives us the mandate as the office uh, to exempt um, organizations from uh, registering by a notice in the Gazette, and we are working on that. But for now, until that notice comes out, uh, every organization is required to register. I hope I've answered uh, that question, plus uh, Misha's question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. I hope that addresses that query that we've been getting from many clients. Now to Mr. Satyajit, um, for organizations to better know the gaps in their processes, especially the big organizations that handle a lot of data, when you look at uh, organizations with websites and have cookies and all, and have very many complex systems. 
And in Uganda, we see very many organizations have a system as well as hard copy. So they usually collect the data on hard copy, then transfer it to the system. Can you please just give uh, from the technical standpoint, uh, what do you recommend uh, for organizations to better know the gaps in their data protection processes? How do you recommend they perform the data protection impact assessments and what do they need to add to their risk matrices for their for them to be compliant and not to be caught offside with the law? Thank you, Alison, for that question. And um, I think um, for starters, when we're trying to understand what an organization's threat landscape looks like, especially from a data standpoint, we need to understand that um, it could be an internal um, decision that the organization within its premises, for starters. That's one. Second, uh, they could have outsourced service providers. That's number two. Uh, three, they collect information both of employees and probably uh, client facing information, which could be customers, suppliers, um, in, in uh, any company for that matter, these particular set of stakeholders exist. Now, with that said and done, when you look at companies that have um, looked at uh, automating, that have looked at um, you know, uh, using technology as an enabler of services and have tried to automate certain areas, there are data touch points that then come into existence. So when a data touch point comes into existence, we're looking at uh, a data life cycle that would then start forming. So which means that it could basically be a form that could be input into a system. So when you're starting with that, of course, there is that collection and creation of data. So one, the creation of data is through the physical form. And two, the creation of data is also on the system. So which means that there is a particular life cycle that will then start from that particular area. It then goes to the next point, which is basically to see where is this information used? How is it being used? Is it being used for one system? Is it being used between more than one system? Are there two or more systems that are interacting? And then it goes to the third, which is basically to evaluate what that information is being used for and for what purposes is it then going to be um, uh, used for? And at that point, is it going to be archived or not? Is it going to be further processed? Then it goes to the next point, which is now probably for purposes of performing uh, a particular business process, the, the, the information needs to be shared or disseminated to another source uh, or another organization. Uh, and uh, probably the last, the second last, I would say, is basically now on the access and reuse of this information, and obviously looking at the entire planning and designing of the security around that particular solution. So, like the electronic data, the fact that the physical data can be accessible by those not potentially be authorized or should not be able to access this particular information, can access this information, there should be some uh, safeguards that the organization needs to then adopt. For instance, a clear desk policy. Uh, in, uh, I can give you an example, like if you're looking at a bank and there is a, uh, a teller or if there is a uh, back office um, processor who has a, a desk full of forms, and someone who's working around the back office, probably someone who's, um, you know, uh, a vendor for that matter, a cleaning vendor could probably take photographs of that particular form and use that for his own benefit. It could also lead to any sort of malicious um, intent person might have. So which then brings in the element of uh, control around the physical forms for starters. So one is the organization should first understand where the risks lie in collection of that particular data and how that data is being created, by who is it being created, who is responsible for that data collection, who is authorized to collect that data on behalf of the customer for whatever processing that they require to do. That, those are the controls that need to be first established. When it comes to the business processes now, which is where the analysis of this particular data happens, to what extent is the data that has been collected used? So which means that are you collecting excess data? Are you collecting data that is not required for purposes of carrying out your business process is the second gap that the organization needs to uh, understand. From that perspective, they also need to understand when they're collecting the minimum uh, acceptable data, is that data then being used internally? 
or is that data used externally for external purposes? For instance, if I have a service that is outsourced and is not internal to the organization, how is my vendor being contracted? What are the rights that the data subject uh, has when I'm transferring this data to a vendor or to someone who's potentially outside the country for whatever information processing that I would require or analysis that I would require? So an organization will definitely need to understand that from a systems perspective. And when it comes to information systems, there are a lot of technical details that will then come in from the aspect of storage, transmission, uh, retrieval, all the way to basically even um, the encryption methodologies that are there in place. So for them to understand the risk landscape, they need to be very clear on what kind of architecture they currently have in place around the business processes, whether the controls that are there within the business processes are largely automated using information systems, or are they largely um, IT related manual controls or dependent manual controls where you have probably one side of the process that requires manual data processing while the other side requires electronic data processing and, seg and uh, making sure that these two areas are segmented very clearly and are separated from each other so that you know this, the information is very clear. Um, now moving to the next area, which is now, of course, looking at share, um, archival and reuse. There is that specific purpose that then comes in as to who has access to this information, for what access, for what do they need this access, and to what extent. Uh, the reason being the five greatest threats that any organization faces at this particular time has to do with, um, you know, looking at social engineering elements, which means that, you know, it could be a threat that is within the organization. It could be an employee who's probably been tipped, maybe corporate espionage or any of that sort, maybe a phishing email that is uh, focused on, um, you know, uh, probably gathering credentials of an employee so that uh, someone can gain unauthorized access uh, or even trying to uh, create some sort of a backdoor for data leakage purposes is one of the biggest threats that you can look at. Um, and a simple information uh, uh, data leak would, or information data leak would look like, you know, uh, obtaining an email address through scrapping the internet, which is pretty much available right now. Uh, and there are so many tools that are out there that you can use this for free. Um, second is, you know, when a company shares in information outside, there is that risk associated with the contractual obligation of the person who's processing this information on behalf of the collector. So from that perspective, we still need to understand how this supply chain risks are mitigated for an organization because then in an event there has been a data breach or a data loss, data theft, then there could be a potential obligation or some sort of a legal obligation that would then arise to the company up to and including risks to do with defamation um, and, and overall reputational damage. Uh, third is, you know, internal employees or also the, the contractors, subcontractors, associated stakeholders with the organization, when they use publicly available information storage uh, facilities such as Dropbox, such as Google Drive, such as OneDrive, that are not authorized by specific uh, organizational guidelines, then what they're trying to do is they're trying to upload information that is uh, pretty much accessible in public platforms without any sort of a contractual obligation between themselves and the people where this information or whose information has been collected and uploaded to these uh, particular um, uh, clouds storage uh, areas. So which then creates another gap where organizations then will need to ascertain to what extent or to where that data is. Because if, for instance, if uh, a data subject asks that uh, please delete all my information, then the company is obligated to do that and show that without um, doubt and in a reasonable manner. So which means that one, the company needs to ascertain where this data resides and two, have access to this data to actually establish that this data exists or not. Um, and four is use of unauthorized devices. You see, we've seen a lot of companies, um, especially large uh, conglomerates and multinational companies that allow bring your own device. Uh, policies within the firm, which means that someone can access uh, the, the, the firm's um, infrastructure, core infrastructure using their own personal devices, wherever they are, especially with uh, the work from home culture that's now rampant. Uh, when, when that particular thing comes in, then, you know, the security around how this particular transmission or access then happens because of the fact that this is an unauthorized device from a company's perspective and the asset is not owned and governed by the particular entity, 
the risk still lies with the entity because this is something that is outside um, the asset uh, portfolio that the organization manages and maintains and governs. So which means that this information could be um, tampered with, could be stolen, could be lost during transmission, could also uh, identify other personally identifiable information such as a, an employee's location or an employee's um, IP address for that matter. So which is also something that the organization would then need to assess because here we're looking at both external versus internal. And the last is something that is very common and that is probably loss of um, company devices or theft of company devices. So in certain in these kind of situations, understanding the risk that are associated with this particular confidential information that could potentially fall into um, hands of uh, or into the wrong hands. For instance, uh, you know, when we're looking at um, sensitive personal information such as biometric um, uh, information, um, uh, IRS information, things to do with healthcare, things to do with bank account details, something that is either directly or indirectly um, uh, identifiable to a person, then definitely the organization faces risks of um, reputation damages, etc. So largely these are the five areas that a company should look at or an organization should look at when they're dealing with this kind of an impact assessment. So impact assessment generally looks at or rather what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to understand if you're embarking on a new project, if you're currently um, probably midway into a project or if you're thinking about finishing a project or starting a new project, which could mean deployment of a hardware, deployment of a new software, uh, understanding uh, pr probably you know what uh, needs to be done within your IT landscape to improve the privacy of the organization um, and how it handles personally identifiable information and data. That is where now impact assessments need to be done because you need to first ascertain the kind of risks that you're looking at, the technology that you're looking at, the vendor support that you're looking at, and how this information can then lead to potential risks, what kind of controls you need to then put in place and to what level of maturity should these controls be to reduce the impact that it would have on the organization based on the risks is what then needs to come out very clearly as you embark on a new project or, or you know, not probably go ahead with the existing project or, or bring an existing project to closure. So uh, from an impact assessment perspective, there are various areas that you then need to understand, especially um, uh, when you're trying to see, you know, what is the need for an impact assessment? You need to describe the overall process. You need to consider uh, probably, uh, you know, with the help of an expert to see where these particular risks lie and to what extent you need to assess the necessity and you need to assess the proportionality to which this particular uh, project um, could probably have an impact on personally identifiable data. Uh, you need to identify assess risks, you need to measure these risks, you need to sign off and have some sort of a ownership that would then come in to say that yes, we have as an organization considered risks and then integrate the entire process so that you have data privacy by default that comes into the organization. And when you're changing an existing process, and you need to bring in some sort of uh, controls that are in place, then you're looking at data privacy by design. And uh, these are two very different elements that you need to then keep continuously monitoring to ensure that the risk landscape that is very volatile and that is very dynamic is also um, uh, being monitored with particular level of control maturity that could then produce the overall impact assessment. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to give it back to Alison. Uh, so over to you, Alison. I hope I've answered the question. Thank you very much, Mr. Satyajit. Uh, because we're running out of time, I'll ask the panelists to be a bit brief as we ask these very, very key questions. So over to you, Ghazali. Now, um, on, on an organization perspective, uh, we know all of them are supposed to have a designated data privacy officer who is registered with the office. Uh, what are the duties? What are they supposed to be doing? And what do you? What are they supposed to be doing as per the the act and regulations? And what on a day to day routine? What is it that the these data privacy officers should be doing to make sure that their companies remain compliant? And also, given the fact that we know that uh, we don't have a lot of skilled personnel when it comes to the data privacy space, is this a function that can be outsourced? 
to an organize another organization. Uh, also, uh, Madam Director, can can elucidate on that after you're done. Over to you, Gazali. Thank you, Alison. Um, so, what I will do is, uh, uh, of course, again, in the interest of time, I'll try to be as uh, brief as possible and uh, ensure to give Madam Stella as much time as required. Uh, because definitely we, we are privileged to hear from her and, uh, you know, we are honored. So basically, I would say in regarding to the, the what is required of a data protection officer, very briefly, I would say it is, a, a, you know, the, the data, data protection officer is required to implement the processes and procedures to ensure compliance to the Data Protection and Privacy Act of 2019. Um, moving on. The routine examples, or rather the routine activities that uh, that they need to perform. So uh, there are uh, things to do with the conducting of end user trainings, assessments, and data privacy sensitization drives. Um, to conduct regular assessments and audits to ensure compliance with the Act. Um, to serve as the point of contact between the person institute or public body and the PDPO. Uh, fourth is to maintain records of all data processing activities conducted by the person, institute or public body. And uh, the last one is to, to respond to that data subjects and to inform them about the, their personal data or rather how their personal data is being used and what measures the person, institute or public body has put in place to protect that data. And actually, this is the last one, then to ensure that the data subjects requests to see copies of their personal data or to have their personal data erased are fulfilled or responded to as necessary. Uh, yes, I had to read all of this, so <laughs> uh, obviously it is difficult to keep all of this in, in you know, in, in memory. And then uh, finally, the, uh, the outsourcing function. So looking through the guidance notes that uh, were shared by the Personal Data Protection Office. Uh, there is somewhere where we have it's been mentioned that this function can be outsourced uh, as long as there is appropriate authorization to sign on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I think, Madam Stella, now I would like to hand it over to you for more details. And uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ghazali. Uh, you've read uh, what the law provides, um, but um, from the office perspective, we, as you already indicated, the DPO is our contact person. And in many cases, when we get complaints, the first person we contact is the, is the data protection officer. Uh, generally, without even, you know, reading uh, in particular what the law provides, the data protection officer's role is to ensure or to help the organization uh, comply with the act. And this will go beyond Madam Stella, I think we've lost you there. Gazali, can you please confirm that it's not just on my end? Yes, I could. we cannot see here or see. It seems like there is a the breakage or something. Okay. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I'll ask that we, unless uh, if we get the director back on board, then maybe we'll give her a bit of time to give some closing remarks. In the interest of time, I ask that we stop here. We, uh, uh, Hemal has shared in the chat box uh, the email ID. But okay, apologies for you. that. <laughs> Technology, my power had something, so I had to switch to another uh, another network. Where was I? I was talking about the role of the data protection officer. Um, I can give an example, for instance, beyond uh, dealing with the issues related to data subjects and the overall compliance of the organization, would expect that if, uh, for instance, an organization is coming up with a new product, 
that the data protection officer will be part of that decision making body for them to guide the organization and ensure that they are uh, in compliance. In terms of outsourcing, uh, the law does not restrict an organization from outsourcing. And we've seen that um, uh, in some of the applications we've received, uh, companies have uh, outsourced either to uh, consulting companies or to lawyers uh, and, other, and other professionals. What we require as an office is that even when you outsource, we want to identify an individual or a human being that we will talk to. So it's not enough to say I'm outsourcing to Grant Thornton. We want to know that yes, Grant Thornton is handy, but the designated data protection officer is Elson uh, Tuinomgisha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Stella. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, I see we are 11 minutes overdue. I'd like to beg that we stop here. Uh, Hemala shared our email ID in case you have any questions for us uh, that we haven't expounded on. Just please do reach out to any of us. We'll gladly share our insights and if need be, we can always help you also get in touch with the Data Protection Office for any guidance that might be required. Uh, we are going to be posting this video online on our YouTube channel. And uh, we also shared a write-up on the act with the meeting invite. If anyone needs that, it's available on our website and we can also share it with you via mail should you need. At uh, this point, I'd like to ask uh, the panelists in one minute to just give their closing remarks, starting with uh, Mr. Amit. Thank you, Alison. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Madam Stella. It has been a pleasure uh, knowing more about the data protection of Uganda. Uh, and I can see there are a lot of similar similarities. And Kenya and Uganda being neighbors, I'm sure there is a lot of opportunity for collaboration between both countries' data protection offices uh, so that the international trade, the data transfers between both, both countries can be smoother. Uh, and and, and uh, as a closing remark, all I would like to state is registration with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the Uganda Data Commissioner's Office, uh, the, the, the Personal Data Protection Office, or the Kenya Data Protection Office is just a start. A compliance is ongoing, right? Uh, compliance uh, data protection that just does not stop with registration. So my recommendation would be if the compliance, you have not started the registration process, firstly start the registration process and then start the compliance requirements and look at the data inventories, look at exactly what data you share. Uh, yeah, and then as, as I said, yeah, you said sorry. Yeah, thank you. I think that, that is from me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, bye for now. Thank you very much, Mr. Amit. Uh, Ghazali, closing remarks. Thank you, Alison. I, at this point, I would I don't see the need to add anything much because we have already talked uh, quite a bit. Uh, uh, all I can do is just to thank everyone, our clients, colleagues, well wishers for joining us, and we do hope that in future we can have more uh, such discussions. I'd also like to thank Madame Stella from the PDPO. She, we, we do appreciate her finding the time and, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving us this uh, discussion. And uh, yeah, that's about it. We hope to, to, to hear from her in future as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kazali. Mr. Satyajit. Especially uh, from the office of the PDPO, uh, the National Director herself, Madam Stella. Madam Stella, um, thank you for making time and uh, gracing us uh, our um, session. Um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Gadia for his uh, valuable insights um, into um, the law um, that governs our uh, particular landscapes uh, from data privacy and uh, protection standpoint. And all the other panelists, especially Ghazali, who's taking time um, to make sure that we are on the route of compliance. 
um, towards the UDPA. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Satya. Uh, Madam Stella, any closing remarks for us? Uh, thank you, Ellison. I hope you can allow me two minutes. Uh, there are some few questions that were uh, shared with us very early on in the in the webinar, and I just wanted to briefly touch on them, uh, especially from uh, Samuel. Uh, Samuel, we are working on a framework um, that will enable uh, compliance assessments to be done within the organizations and then we'll be able to issue a certificate of compliance. That is not yet done, but it is in, uh, in progress. On how you can protect um, and manage data to drive uh, business growth, um, we need to know that um, complying with um, data protection laws does not stop you making use of data. There are other measures that can be taken. You can anonymize, you can uh, seek consent. There are many things that you can do um, to be able to utilize the data. The argument normally is that, oh, because I have to comply with uh, uh, data protection laws or privacy laws, I will not be able to make use of this data. You can, and uh, the two can be done uh, seamlessly. We can have uh, a discussion on that. Um, there was a question on legitimate interest. Um, uh, we do have frequently asked questions on our website. Please have a look at them. Uh, but legitimate interest um, and our law, the bulk of the responsibility is given to the organization to determine what legitimate interest is. But knowing that if they do it uh, in a manner that abuses the rights of the individuals, they will, be, they will be the ones to face um, the penalties. Uh, we expect that courts in due course will develop jurisprudence around this. But for now, uh, the office, uh, office uses the definition as provided for um, under the Act. I, I think those were the major ones that uh, we needed to respond to. I want to thank, um, first of all, our attendees for being here, um, over 100 of you. We are available to keep educating, uh, to keep creating this awareness. So I want to thank uh, Grant Thornton and um, my fellow panelists. There's a lot of uh, knowledge uh, that we had today, and I hope that we can continue some of uh, these uh, discussions. As an office, we do have um, monthly webinars where we talk about topical issues. Uh, in the field of data protection and privacy. Uh, you can find uh, the videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for being with us, and I enjoyed uh, our discussion this morning. Thank you, Grant Thornton. Thank you very much, Madam Stella. Uh, at this juncture, I'd like to invite our CEO, COO partner and IBC Director for Grant Thornton Advisory East Africa Limited, Mr. Kunal Ajmer to give a vote of thanks and officially close the webinar. Thank you, Alison. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I would just like to close today's session with a vote of thanks, uh, starting with uh, our distinguished guest, Madam Stella. It's always a pleasure to have uh, somebody from the government giving their uh, views on uh, regulatory matters like this. And uh, as you rightly said, our purpose of this webinar was to uh, spread the awareness, create awareness so that more and more people uh, comply with these regulation. And uh, we are with you in this journey and we hope to uh, hold similar such uh, webinars in future. I would also like to thank Mr. Uh, Amit Kadia. Uh, thanks for your expert opinion on this matter, uh, being a subject matter expert. Uh, and then last but not least, of course, I would like to thank all my colleagues, um, Satyajit, uh, Ghazali, Allison, and Hamel. Um, thanks for bringing out much needed clarity on this uh, subject matter. Of course, it's a, it's a evolving law. There are evolving situation and there would always be um, confusion in people and it is our job to 
clarify this. So with that, I would like to end uh, today's session. As Alison had uh, said, we will share uh, the recording and Q&A uh, of this session, and uh, we hope to see you in future webinars. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, sir. Webinar is officially closed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.